October 16, 1931, Phoenix, Arizona. Winnie Ruth Judd is visiting her two best friends, Ann and Sammy, at their small bungalow. They'd been playing bridge. But when the night is over, only Ruth is alive. And what follows would be a saga of death, dismembered bodies, playboys, leaking trunks, death sentences, escapes, confessions, and commutations. It's the stuff of legends, but it's all true. The question is, which truth are we to believe? This is the story of Winnie Ruth Judd, The Trunk Murders. Hey y'all, I'm Chris Calvert. And I'm her husband, Rob Potter. Welcome to Hitch to Homicide. For better or worse. Till death do us part. everybody yes welcome 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 and for our friends in warm hawaii uh, which i wish we were there right now. me too it's frigid yes it's very cold here Wilena, Wilena, Wilena. mahalo <laughs> here you go and what's your favorite <laughs> christmas song Meli kaliki maka there you go <laughs> <laughs> it is it's my very favorite one yeah yeah <laughs> Well, wherever you're listening, be it Hawaii or somewhere where it's chilly like we are today, yep. be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening. Yep. And if you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button below. Yes. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media at Hitch to Homicide on Instagram and H2H underscore podcast on X. Excellent. And if you want more true crime, please join the H2H In-Laws and Outlaws, where I post photos from the episodes and chat all things true crime. And others in our crew post things like, the effort I put into not being a serial killer really (laughs) needs to be acknowledged. (laughs) I also like that it was a skeleton doing yoga with knives. (laughs) Yeah. Nice. Well played, Cheryl Workman. Thank you for that. (laughs) Thanks, Cheryl. Namaste. Namaste. (laughs) We want to encourage you to check out the new form on our H2H website where you can tell us your own true crime story or your brush with true crime. Please do. We will cover them as we get to them. Yes. So this case is 92 years old. Wow. It is just as intriguing today as it was in 1931. Okay. And I want to send a big thank you out to Liz Fiedler for suggesting that we cover... Winnie, Ruth, and the Trunk Murders. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. Or as she would say in the house, Bunny. Thank you, Liz. (laughs) Joanne. Sorry. (laughs) Movie reference. Oh, my gosh. It's early. And here they are already. Yep. Before we get started, let me thank some sources. Offbeat Oregon, Murderpedia, Wikipedia, the Arizona Daily Star, the Phoenix New Times, Medium.com, KJZZ 95.1, Hushed Up History, The Tucson Citizen, and the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records. All right. Well, you ready? I am. Well, let's do it. Winifred Ruth McKinnell, Winnie, is born on January 20th, 1905, in the middle of a blizzard in Darlington, Indiana. Sounds like today. I was going to (laughs) say, we're right in the middle in Kentucky. We've just had all kinds of snow. Yep. Darlington, Indiana is a tiny little town northwest of Indianapolis here in the United States. She's the daughter of the Right Reverend H.J. McKinnell, a free Methodist minister, and his wife, Carrie. Okay. She's raised in the church, never missing a service, where during the Pentecostal worship I read, manifestations happened all the time, Mm -hmm. meaning they felt the power of the Holy Spirit, which I'm going to go out on a limb and say during worship, maybe they were speaking in tongues. And had some tambourines. (laughs) I don't know. Some dancing (laughs) going on, maybe. I'm sure. According to one source, Winnie always wanted to be a mother. And in fact, I read in a 1931 newspaper article that she did want to be a mom. 
When she was seven years old, she went to school and told her friends that her mother was having a baby. Hmm. So the girls went home and told their mothers, and those moms went to Carrie <laughs> to say, congratulations, we hear that you've got a little bundle of joy on the way. Oh, wow. Except there was no baby on the way. No bundle of joy. No. <laughs> When Winnie is a teenager, she accuses her boyfriend of getting her pregnant. She'd never had sex with him huh. or any other boy. And when her parents take her to a doctor who says, no, Winnie, you are not pregnant. Yeah. And no, Winnie has never had sex. She still claimed she was pregnant. Hmm. Now, at one point, Winnie ran away from home. And when she came back, she told everybody she'd been kidnapped and she had given birth. But there was no baby. So even from an early age, Winnie's probably just a little bit mentally ill in some way. Yeah, I think. Well, it's called pseudosiesis. And women will actually have morning sickness and some symptoms of pregnancy when they believe that they are pregnant, but they are not. Really? Yes. So the mind over body. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Except, you know, when I was pregnant, it, mm, <laughs> I was so sick. There was no mind over body. There was no, yeah. <laughs> no, when I was pregnant, I was so sick. I needed Winnie's church. <laughs> I needed the healing of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> there was no mind over body. There was no yeah. mind over body at all. <laughs> but when she's a teenager, she goes to work at the Indiana State Hospital as an attendant. So maybe what we would call today a nurse's aide or an orderly. Okay. She's still super young. She's doing so well at the hospital. They're starting to give her more and more responsibility. Hmm. Hold that thought. Okay. Holding. William Craig Judd was in his early 30s and a recent graduate of Willamette University College of Medicine. Hmm. You can see where this is going. Yeah. She works at a hospital. Yeah. This is when the United States joined in the fight in World War I. He joined up and was commissioned a first lieutenant and was sent to France to work on the front line as a surgeon. I can only imagine. That's just like a saw and yeah. some morphine and yeah. Some ether and that's about it. Yeah. I don't even think they had that most of the time. Mm. In 1918, a German shell injured William and he himself used morphine to take the pain away. But no one stopped him from taking the morphine after his wounds healed. Uh -huh. He drifted around from position to position, and on his way down the medical hierarchy, he took a job at the Indiana State Hospital, and it's here that he meets Winnie, the cute, tiny, 17-year-old blonde attendant. Reminds me of Catch Me If You Can. Yeah, I mean, a little bit like it. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. She gets her braces off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Except this guy was a real doctor. Except he was a real doctor. Do you concur? Do you concur? I concur. So you concur. <laughs> it's a great scene. These two fell hard for each other. And in April of 1929, Winnie marries Dr. Judd. He is more than twice her age. Mm. She's 17. He is 43. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. I also read that she was 19. Okay. I really believe that she loved him. But at the same time, maybe she just wanted to get married and have, have a baby. A baby. Yeah. 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 These two honeymoon in New Orleans, and then Winnie's new husband dragged her off to Mexico. Every single source said that he dragged her off to Mexico. Hmm. And I just kept on like by the hair of the head, yeah. or <laughs> she was just an unwilling participant to going to Mexico. I can just see her but like by one ankle. Yeah, he's <laughs> dragging her off to Mexico to live, <laughs> yeah. where Dr. Judd was working as a medic for the American silver miners. Hmm. Again, another source said it was copper miners. But because of his addiction to morphine, he had a hard time keeping a job, and they moved around a lot. Gotcha. So maybe he did work for both copper and silver miners. All right. He was a doctor, so someone was always willing to pick him up, but he'd lose his job again. Hmm. This, of course, put a strain on their marriage, not to mention Winnie had contracted tuberculosis, oh. TB. And on top of that, Dr. Judd would not allow Winnie to get pregnant. He didn't want children. Ooh. Something perhaps Winnie should have known before <laughs> saying I do, yeah. <laughs> considering she wanted a baby so badly. It's like Adam Sandler in The Wedding Singer. And things that could have been brought to my attention yesterday! This would have been information that I would have liked yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Exa> <laughs> <the> yes. <laughs> 
She would beg him to let her have a baby, but he always insisted on birth control. But when he quit using her birth control method, which was probably one of the first diaphragms, without telling William, and did get pregnant. Mm. And when William decided Winnie was not emotionally or physically able to have a baby, he performed an abortion on her. And after this, she fell into a very deep depression. Uh, yeah. yeah. She's wanted a baby since she's, she's lied about babies since she was seven. She's yeah. wanted a baby since she was a little girl. Of course. She did get pregnant again and actually ran away to try to keep the baby, but she miscarried. And on top of this, her husband, William, wasn't religious. And they were moving around a lot. And she was used to a stable home and a church life. Sure. So Winnie really left herself behind in Indiana when she got married. And he dragged her off to Mexico. <laughs> Maybe that's what they meant by it. Dragging her off to Mexico? Yeah. 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 No, I'm, I am sort of surmised that from all the information that she was really missing her church family and and right. the stable life. Sure. Now, because of her tuberculosis, William sent her to a facility in California where she seemed to get better. But when she went back to him and Mexico, it flared back up again. Mm. So William's a little selfish and controlling, but she loved him. And she always wanted him to stop using the morphine and alcohol. Mm. But when he lost his last job in Mexico, these two make a cross-country trip to the States and Laredo, Texas. And when they arrive, William uses the money they have left and even sold their car in order to fuel his drug habit. Wow. At this point, Winnie leaves him. So by 1930, these two are living separate lives for the most part, but they stayed in constant communication. Okay. Then Winnie who then decided to go by her middle name, Ruth, Ruth moved to Phoenix, Arizona, where the climate was better for her tuberculosis. Oh, right. She also cut her long hair into a bob. Hmm. And while she's there, she worked as a governess to a wealthy family, the Lee Ford family. Wait, what? what's a governess? A governess is like a nanny. Oh. She's um, Mary Poppins. <laughs> okay. We Mary Poppins. It's nice to see you again, Bet. Without the umbrella. Without the umbrella. All right. Uh, and the bad British accent. <laughs> I'm only talking about Dick Van Dyke. Yeah. Only talking about Dick Van Dyke. Julie had the real one. Yes, Miss <laughs> Miss Julie Andrews. Right. She had the real one for sure. Yep. But she's a governess, so she loves his job very much. And when she had money, she sent for her husband to come from El Paso to California and had him committed to a veteran's hospital there for his drug treatment. Oh, good for her. Now, while Ruth is working for the Ford family, she meets their next door neighbor, John J. Happy Jack Halloran. <laughs> Happy Jack. <laughs> Happy Jack. <laughs> Jack was a part owner in one of the biggest lumber yards in Phoenix. He was handsome. He was 44 years old. He's a mover and shaker, loads of charm. Jack liked to party. Mm. And even though he was married and had three children, he liked his women on the side. Yeah. Jack was also big into the country club scene in Phoenix. These two meet on Christmas Eve, 1930, and Jack made his move and Ruth is lonely and still young and beautiful, and she fell for Jack like a ton of bricks. <laughs> wow. These two start having a secret affair, and Ruth is really wrestling with who she's become. She's still married to a husband she's committed to. She's put him in the hospital for his drug addiction. She loved him, and deep inside, her conservative and religious upbringing is telling her, you're you're not doing the right thing, <laughs> yeah, Ruth. I'm sure, yeah. Winnie Ruth. Yep. But she loved the feeling of being young and beautiful and that a powerful, wealthy, handsome man like Jack was attracted to her. Can only mean trouble. Lots of trouble. Yeah. Soon, Ruth takes a job leaving the Fords. Maybe they discovered that their next door neighbor was stooping their nanny <laughs> and they parted ways. Hmm. Regardless... She took another job, a better paying job, as a medical secretary at the Grinnell Clinic. And in 1931, when the clinic opened, it was kind of in a class all its own. And it might have been the first building and medical clinic to have the doctors near the hospitals. 
It opened with 13 specialists, a lab, a research center, a radiology department, and a medical library. Oh, wow. It was created in memory of Lois Anita Grinnell, who was a seven-year-old girl who died in Chicago after she was misdiagnosed. And her father was a wealthy businessman, and he gave a million dollars to the clinic to be built in Phoenix. I can't imagine what a million dollars was worth at that time. A lot. Yeah. And it was a really big deal to work there. Hmm. And that is where Ruth is now going to work. Okay. And while she's at the Grinnell Clinic, Winnie meets Agnes Ann Leroy and Hedvig Sammy Samuelson. Wow. Hedvig. Hedvig. (laughs) We're going to call her Sammy from here on out because everybody called her Sammy. All right. Sammy and Ann became friends while living in Alaska, then moved together to Phoenix because Sammy also had tuberculosis. Tuberculosis seemed to be kind of prevalent during that time period. Yeah, it was it was a really big thing. And, you know, it's pretty much been stamped out around the world. Right. I, I think I've said this before in a podcast. Kentucky in the Appalachian Mountains, Appalachia, there are still cases of TB. Really? Yes. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there have been papers written about it. Yeah. But these three girls become the best of friends. Okay. Anne was 32 years old and twice divorced. She was from Oregon, and she worked as an x-ray technician. Sammy was only 24. She was from North Dakota and had been a teacher. And Ruth is now 26. Gotcha. So she's still super young. Yeah. Now, there are those who believe that Anne and Sammy were bisexual and in a relationship. These two lived together in a small studio bungalow on North 2nd Street. Now... I don't know if that's true or not, but apparently if you live with somebody long enough or come from Alaska to Phoenix with somebody, maybe you're bisexual. Gotcha. I think it was just odd for them to be older and living together for so long. Sure. Which today no one would even bat an eye. Right. Ruth moves in with these two for a short time, but three women in a tiny space was too much. I actually read it was three rooms. Mm. So Ruth moved to Brill Street to live alone. But the girls were always getting together and Jack would bring his married buddies and some booze and would party with Ruth and Ann and Sammy. And sometimes the boys played cards. Okay. These men, in particular Happy Jack, would often give the three girls money and buy them gifts. And Jack was sleeping... With all three of them. <laughs> he was happy Jack. He was happy Jack. <laughs> I don't know if that's big Jack or little Jack that's happy Jack. <laughs> it had to be said. It had to be said. <laughs> Maybe Sorry. both. Yeah. I also read that he was supporting all three of them financially, but mostly Ann and Sammy. Don't know if that's true or not either. Okay. Ann and Sammy liked Jack, and there were plenty of times Jack partied only with Ann and Sammy leaving Ruth out. Hmm. She wasn't invited. Wow. wonder why. Well, maybe there was a three-way going on. Ah. A little menage a trois action. Beyond my comprehension. Well, I have to say, while I was researching all of this, all I could think about when I read Happy Jack was Anchorman, where Brian Fantana says, <laughs> I have a nickname for my penis. It's called the Octagon. <laughs> yes, I have a nickname for my penis. It's called the Octagon. <laughs> I couldn't help thinking that John J. Happy Jack Halloran <laughs> yeah. named his penis Happy Jack. Yeah. The only three-way I can handle is Skyline. I know. You can only handle a three-way for and if chili. you don't know what Skyline is out there, just look it up <laughs> on the internet. It's my favorite. Well, I wasn't thinking about chili. <laughs> <laughs> I was. <laughs> I was just thinking about Happy Jack. Right. Mm-hmm. The octagon. Right. <laughs> then Dr. Judd, who had now sobered up, came to Phoenix to live with his wife. Hmm. But she didn't stop him from partying. Really? And it sucked him right back into drinking. Hmm. Even though Sammy and Ann were like begging her not to bring him to their party. Sure. Well, I don't think they were so worried about him losing his sobriety. I think they probably thought that he was an old man and he was going to be yeah. a damper on the party. Yeah. Because he had to be so much older than everybody else. Of course. But it didn't last long. Dr. William Judd took a job in Los Angeles in August of 1931, leaving Ruth behind again to live with his sister in Santa Monica. Hmm. 
Two months later, after her husband has come and gone, on October 15th, Ruth introduced Jack to a nurse from the clinic named Lucy Moore. And I don't know if Ruth's plan was to have her own menage a trois with Jack and Lucy or not. Mm -hmm. But there was a hunting trip planned and Lucy was from the area where they were going. So after Jack and Ruth picked up Lucy, Jack wants to stop by Sammy and Ann's place. And this is a problem because Ruth had kind of lied to them about what she was doing with Jack. So Ruth turned down Ann and Sammy's invitation to come party with them, saying she had to work. So when Jack stopped by their place and told Sammy and Ann to come out and say hello, Ruth was kind of caught off guard. You know, she was caught red-handed. Sure. And she had to introduce Lucy to the girls. Oh, okay. And apparently... Sammy and Ann were not happy that Ruth had introduced this beautiful nurse, Lucy, to Jack. Uh Got some competition. Yep. The cat fur's up. The dander is up. Mm -hmm. The hackles are up. Yep. The next night, October 16th, 1931, Ann and Sammy invite Ruth over to play bridge with another friend. But Ruth declines again, saying she had too much work to do. And I read in one source that Jack had told her he was coming over to see her, but he never showed. And around 9 p.m., she changes her mind and she goes over as the other friend is leaving. Okay. When it's just the three of them, Sammy and Ann want to know how Jack met Lucy Moore. And Ruth says, I introduce them. And this started an argument. Hmm. Sammy and Ann threatened to tell Jack that she had introduced him to a woman, meaning Lucy, who had syphilis. And Ruth told the girls, you can't tell that. That's confidential information. And if they did tell, she would get them back for it. She called Ruth a slut (laughs) and threatened to tell William that his wife was sleeping with Happy Jack. Wow. So Ruth threatened... She said that she would tell all the doctors at the clinic that the two of them, Ann and Sammy, were lesbians. Oh, wow. And on top of that, there was a little incident in the x-ray department where Ann had trained a woman to do her job when she had to be out sick because of her tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And this woman, who wasn't formally trained as an x-ray tech, was doing such a good job, Ann got worried that she was going to take her job. And one day she turned up the level on the machine, the x-ray machine, And when the other woman had a patient, the patient was actually burned in some way. Oh, And Ruth knew this whole ruse. Wow. And she told Anne she'd spill the beans on that little episode as well if they told Jack that Lucy had VD. Wow. So they're fighting, and Ruth turned and went into the kitchen to put a glass in the sink. I heard it was a glass of milk. And when she turned around, Sammy was standing with a gun pointed at her. Wow. A 25 caliber handgun. Jeez. I do believe this is Ruth's gun. Like maybe it's out of her purse. Okay. She's shouting that she better not say anything to anyone about Anne. So Sammy's like, you better not say anything. Hmm. Like she's protecting Anne. Sure. At this point in the argument, they both struggled with the gun. They both reached for the gun. How many times have we heard this in these 1930s cases? Yeah. While Sammy and Ruth fight over the gun, Anne started hitting Ruth over the head with an ironing board. This is when the first shot goes off and Ruth is shot in the hand when she's grabbing the gun barrel. Mm. Then Sammy wields the gun and Ruth picked up a knife, stabbing her in the shoulder. So Sammy winces at this and Ruth gets her hands back on the gun. And after the struggle, according to Ruth, the gun went off, killing Sammy. Wow. But Sammy was shot three times. It went off accidentally three times. The shoulder, the chest, and head. Oh. And of course, she stabbed her once. Wow. And when Anne came at her, she shot Anne as well. In the head. Oh. And at least one of these headshots will be at close range, according to the autopsy. Really? Like against the temple. Oh. That's not good. Now, there are several stories of what happened next, and I'm going to do my best to suss them out. Ruth goes home, and her plan was to call her husband in L.A., but waiting for her there is Happy Jack. Hmm. He didn't believe her when she says, I've killed them both. But she takes him back to the scene and showed him 
And then this is when he takes charge, telling her he'll take care of everything, and he helped her to clean up the mess. He sent her home to bed and called in a favor from a Dr. Brown. I also read in this theory, he threatened the doctor who was running an illegal abortion clinic with exposure. Gotcha. This Dr. Brown then dismembered Sammy and then put Anne and Sammy's body parts into a steamer trunk. Wow. Also in this scenario, the plan was to take the bodies out into the desert and leave them there, never to be found. Yeah. It is Phoenix. It makes me think of Goodfellas. Yeah. Chop them up and them in the car. The next day, Ruth was supposed to go to work, and she didn't want to not show up. That makes her even look guiltier. Right. When she got home after work, Jack had changed his mind. By the way, she told people at the clinic she'd burned her hand. That's why it was wrapped up, because yeah. it's all bandaged up. Sure. But Jack wanted her to check the bodies as luggage on the train and ship the bodies to L.A. and dump them in the ocean. Her brother and husband both lived there. But the trunk was too heavy to ship, and by the time Ruth realizes this, Jack's gone. So she repacks the bodies and the body parts. Anne was in the steamer trunk alone, and Sammy was in a suitcase, a valise, and a hat box. Wow. And if you don't know what a valise is, it's like a smaller suitcase. So like a carry-on suitcase. Right. Let me guess what was in the hat box. (laughs) you don't want to know what's in any of it (laughs) yeah yeah wow in another version ruth panics after she kills them and stuffs the two bodies in the steamer trunk the next day she had the trunk taken to her home by whom i have absolutely no idea and her plan was to ship the trunk to the coast in order to have her little brother help her dump the bodies in the pacific ocean okay Now, in this story, when she gets these bodies to her home, she dismembers the body of Sammy and put her body parts in different trunks and suitcases. Okay. Ruth and or Jack stuffed the head, torso, and lower legs into the black suitcase, and the upper legs were in the beige valise and a hat box. Man. Anne's body was stuffed intact into a second black steamer trunk. So Anne... She's got a full body. She hasn't been cut up in any way. Okay. Now, what is clear is that two days after the murders, 48 hours of dead bodies and body parts in Phoenix, Mm -hmm. Phoenix, the bags smelled okay at that point. Right. Ruth climbs aboard the Golden State Limited passenger train at Union Station. She has with her the trunks, her valise, and a hat box. Containing the bodies and the body parts. She will. She leaves them with the baggage handler and boards the train. And remember, she had a gunshot wound to her hand, so it's all bandaged up. Sure. So in this scenario, she's cut apart a body with basically the use of only one hand. Hmm. She gets on the train overnight from Phoenix to L.A. When they arrive the next morning at 7.45 a.m., the trunks are under suspicion Because they smell like ass (laughs) and they are leaking body fluids and blood. Yeah. But the trunks and luggage are locked up. And the baggage handlers want to get into them while the train was en route. Well. Let me guess. Yeah. You want to know why? Yeah. Well, they didn't think there were dead bodies inside. But they did think that there was deer meat in there because a deer was considered contraband and people would go out hunting and cut up the deer and put it in steamer trunks or suitcases and ship it to the coast. I had no idea. And it was a no-no. Wow. Arthur V. Anderson, who was in charge that day as the baggage master, saw blood and wanted those trunks opened pronto. Sure. And when he asked Ruth for the key, so she comes to claim her baggage, and he's like, hold up, lady. (laughs) You got to open these up. Sounds like to catch a smuggler. And Exactly. (laughs) He's like, open these up, and Ruth's like, I don't have a key. All right. She tells them, I don't have it with me, and that her husband has it. Yeah. And picking her up that day was not her husband, but her little brother, Burton McKinnell. He was in L.A. because he was a junior at USC. Hmm. She said that her husband had the keys, so the two of them motor away to get the keys, leaving the luggage behind. Hmm. They never 
return. You think? <laughs> Be hightailing out of there. So they arrive at 7.45 a.m. At 4.40 that afternoon, Arthur Anderson calls the LAPD and says, we got a bleeder. We got a bleeder. <laughs> I couldn't resist. That's good. So LAPD picks the locks on these trunks and finds bodies mm. or pieces of bodies. Wow. Now, what I didn't tell you is she takes the hat box and the valise with her. Okay. So she's got a big suitcase and steamer trunk and they find bodies and pieces of bodies. Mm. And her brother, Burton, dropped Ruth off in Los Angeles at 7th and Broadway around 1230. Okay. She is going to disappear. Hmm. And before Ruth went to pick up her luggage, the steamer trunk and the suitcase, she went to the ladies' room and leaves her beige valise and hat box. And it's there that a maid at the Southern Pacific Station opened the case and hat box that had been standing in the women's washroom. And found the rest of Sammy Samuelson. Wow. I think I'd be looking for a new job after that. <laughs> I think I would too. Also in the hat box was a 25 caliber pistol. A gun that Ruth had pawned and then paid the interest on to get it out of the pawn shop months earlier. Which is going to make people believe that the murders of Sammy and Ann were premeditated. Right. Now, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that Ruth knew these two girls and that she had something to do with their deaths. They question Ruth's brother, Burton, who tells police, you're not going to find her because my sister is, quote, very resourceful. <laughs> That's called foreshadowing. Uh-oh, here we go. Yep. <laughs> But Ruth finally surrenders to the police in a funeral home, of all places, where she was hiding out. They pick her up on Friday, October 23rd, 1931. They took her first to a hospital because the gunshot wound to her hand was basically rotting away. She yeah. basically had gangrene. Yeah. She's bruised all over her body. So had she actually been in an altercation or had, she, had something else happened? Right. They call Ruth's husband, William, in from where he was living in Santa Monica with his sister, and they question him and Ruth's brother, Burton, some more. Right. Then they arrest Ruth. The newspapers had a field day <laughs> with the murders. I'm sure they did. She was called the Tiger Woman, hmm. the Blonde Butcher, the Wolf Woman. Oh, wow. But eventually the media just called them the Trunk Murders. Wow. The police went to the scene of the crime in Phoenix on Monday evening, October 19th. Neighbors and reporters were allowed to go inside and gawk at the evidence and blood spatter. And the next day, the landlord took out ads to give tours for 10 cents a person. Jeez. Hundreds of people traipsed through the crime scene. Wow. And police said that they were shot while they were asleep in their beds. They assumed this because the two mattresses were missing. But they found one of the mattresses in a vacant lot with no blood. Right. But one of them was missing, and they were going with this story. They were shot in their bed. Okay. The trial began on January 19th, 1932, just months after the bodies were discovered in the trunks. This was under one of the headlines I found. Uh-oh. <laughs> Quote, a fighting, pushing mob surged into Department 1 of Municipal Court today, eager to see the wolf woman who had killed her best friends and brought their mutilated bodies to Los Angeles as baggage. Mm. They saw her, Winnie Ruth Judd, a frail woman with a white, set face behind which thoughts were hidden. Strange thoughts, such as may have occupied Lady Macbeth, or Lucretia Borgia. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thoughts not for the multitude. Dimly, the white face moved through the packed crowd as though dreaming. Of what? Of a noose hanging beneath the Arizona sky? Yeah. End quote. You know, it sounds like a lot of, especially back then, a lot of newspaper reporters, I think, were frustrated novelists. <laughs> 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 because their descriptions are so flowery. Well, just about every writer would say, I'm a novelist. I'm a frustrated novelist. <laughs> yeah. Even novelists are frustrated novelists. True, true. It's hard work. Yeah. Easy reading is hard writing. Right. 
The state argued that Ruth acted with premeditation, that the relationship between Ruth, Ann, and Sammy had fallen apart over some weeks, and that they had argued over the affections of Jack Halloran. Happy Jack. According to the prosecution, all of this culminated with the murders. She'd snuck into the house, shot both the women in bed, then chopped them up to fit them in the trunks, gone to work for a shift, come home, shot herself in the hand so she could claim self-defense, and then headed for Los Angeles. <laughs> Ruth's defense took the stance that she was innocent because she was insane. <laughs> if all else fails, I'm insane. She was insane. No, okay. They did not introduce the self-defense argument. So why didn't they use the self-defense? I think they thought... She's going down for this. Right. No matter what, she's going down. Okay. And we can either send her to jail or we can send her to a mental institution. Gotcha. Okay. So well, they went for sense. the insanity plea yeah. and they just took self-defense off the table. Makes sense. And besides, the mattresses that Ann and Sammy were supposedly shot on would be soaked in blood if the story were true. Right. And those had vanished and they were allegedly hauled away by teeny tiny little Ruth, who has tuberculosis. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And she had to do it on foot or she had an accomplice because she didn't have a car. Right. And also the cops had allowed the house where the murders took place to be thrown open for visitors to sure. tour. Yeah. Yeah. There was no evidence that hadn't been tampered with. Sure. And soon it became clear the bodies had been dismembered by someone with surgical tools and surgical skills, mm. neither of which Ruth had. Right. Because if she did, don't you think she would have taken care of her own hand? At least that's what I'm thinking. Sure, yeah. They never brought up the dismemberment of Sammy Samuelson in court because Ruth was only tried for the murder of Mrs. Ann Leroy, whose body was not dismembered. Okay. Don't know why. I know you're going to ask me why. I have no idea why. That's strange. It really is. Hmm. And Ruth never took the stand in her own defense. The jury found her guilty of first-degree murder on February 8, 1932. An appeal was unsuccessful, and Winnie Ruth Judd was sentenced to be hanged Ooh. February 17, 1933, and sent to the Arizona State Prison in Florence, Arizona. Now, the jury didn't think she'd be sentenced to death. There's a whole story behind this. Okay. The jury said they'd been convinced by a man named Dan Kleinman to vote to sentence her to death because it would make her give up her accomplices. And then it's discovered that old Dan had a conflict of interest and he was going to find her guilty no matter what. Hmm. But her second appeal was also denied, even though the jury was kind of tampered with. Gotcha. Now, Ruth wasn't without her supporters in Phoenix Sheriff John R. McFadden would become an advocate. And he says that we don't know this whole story. You're putting this woman to death and we don't know the whole story. And he made it perfectly clear that he thought things were moving way too fast. And he was not buying the story that the state prosecutor was selling. He didn't think Ruth did it. And he became one of her defenders and tried solving the case as hard as he could. This came with a lot of backlash he wasn't going to let anyone hang Ruth without a fight. And with the words of the jurors, he gathered witnesses for a grand jury in late 1932. Okay. And her death sentence was repealed after a 10-day hearing found her mentally incompetent. Gotcha. She was then sent to the Arizona State Asylum for the Insane on April 24th, 1933. And if you're not insane before you go to an insane asylum, you will be afterwards. <laughs> oh, just hang on. Uh-oh. It's just getting good. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> when it was discovered during the course of this grand jury that Happy Jack Halloran and Ruth had been involved in an illicit affair, Jack also became a suspect in the killings. He's a known playboy and philanderer. Jack was indicted by a grand jury as an accomplice to murder. On December 30th, 1932, following new testimony from Ruth. Oh. And Ruth referred to this testimony as, quote, the whole truth, end quote. Man. A preliminary hearing on the charges against Jack Halloran was held in mid-January 1933. Ruth is the star witness in testimony that lasted almost three days. An emotional Ruth told her story saying, quote, 
I'm going to be hanged for something Jack Halloran is responsible for. I was convicted of murder, but I shot in self-defense. Jack Halloran removed every bit of evidence. He is responsible for me going through all this. He is guilty of anything I am guilty of, end quote. Wow. She testified she'd gone to the apartment. There was an argument about Ruth's introduction of Jack to this other woman and that she killed Ann and Sammy in self-defense after they physically attacked her. And according to Ruth, she met up with Jack shortly after the killings and returned with him to the apartment. And after seeing the bodies, he went out to the garage and came back with a, quote, great heavy trunk, end quote, and told her not to tell anybody. And under cross-examination, Ruth admitted repacking Sammy's dismembered body in a suitcase and other luggage two days after the murders. Okay. What yep. about that doctor? That's still Dr. Brown is still in there somewhere, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, Jack did not take the stand in his own defense. His attorney told the court that Ruth's story was nothing more than, quote, the story of an insane person, end <laughs> quote, and argued that since Ruth had testified that the two women were killed in self-defense, there was, in fact, no crime committed. Therefore, Jack Halloran could not be tried for anything. <laughs> and Jack's attorney then asked for the charges against his client to be dismissed. On January 25th, 1933, the judge freed Jack Halloran, saying that the state's case was inconsistent and that trying him would be, quote, an idle gesture, end quote. Wow. That sounds like the good old boy network to yep, me. Yep. Sorry. A little slap on the back. So on April 23rd, 1933, Ruth goes to the mental hospital, a place that was understaffed, and there was more strict discipline than treatment and the place Winnie Ruth went was the most overcrowded mental hospital in the country. Yeah. But she was alive and she learned to cope. She became the unofficial beautician for some of the female patients, fixing them up for dances that the hospital sponsored for inmates. And she was so good, the nurses started paying her to do their hair. Oh, wow. An aide at the asylum, Ann Kelm, remembers Ruth distinctly, quote, she was more like a member of the staff than a patient. She worked unusually hard, did more for that hospital than any two or three people. She wasn't crazy either. She was as sane as anyone, end quote. Wow. But also, according to Ann Kelm, Jack Halloran would show up at these dances. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. He would show up at the dances and, quote, sneer and laugh real nasty at Winnie Ruth. Jeez. And she would just go to pieces. Wow. He was eventually banned from the grounds. <laughs> okay. So even after she goes into a mental institution, he shows up at these dances just to be an ugly person. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's cold. Harry Whitmer, the institution's business manager during the 1940s, who came to know Ruth really well, he was convinced of two things. Quote, as for being insane, no. Also, there was a major question in a lot of people's minds if she was guilty or not, or if she was just taking the rap, end quote. And we're going to talk about this in just a minute. Okay. But first, during Ruth's stint at the mental hospital, during her 30 plus years of being incarcerated from 1933 to 1971, mm. she escaped... Seven times. <laughs> wow. <laughs> in particular, between 1939 and 1962. Wow. October 24th, 1939, for six days, she returned on her own. December 3rd, 1939, for several days, grabbing a bus to Yuma, Arizona, 180 miles away. Police found her there. For this escape, she was put into solitary confinement for 24 months two years, hmm. and she was kept barefoot and in pajamas. Wow. Two years. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty, two years. Jeez. No shoes and in pajamas. Wow. In solitary. I mean, a trip to Yuma is not worth that. Yeah, that's hard. But again, on May 11th, 1947, she's gone for 12 hours. She walked out the door in broad daylight, but was picked up that night, hiding in the grounds of a nearby resort. November 29th, 1951, for a few hours, authorities located her stuck in Phoenix. On February 2nd, 1952, for five days, and while on the lam, she stayed at friends' homes, eventually turning herself in. Mm. 
November 23rd, 1952. She was gone for two days. She escaped after Thanksgiving dinner and was found by police in the home of a friend. <laughs> and then on October 8th, 1962, Ruth escapes for six and a half years. Oh, wow. She skulked around Arizona for several months, hiding out, particularly in Kingman. But Ruth wound up in Oakland, California, where she took a new name, Marion Lane, and even dared to apply at an employment agency for a local job. Wow. Her brother was giving her money, but she wanted to stand on her own two feet. She passed herself off as a maid and was hired by the extremely wealthy Nichols family of San Francisco to serve as both maid and sitter for the aging matriarch affectionately called Mother Nichols. <laughs> okay. Her employer lived in a huge mansion overlooking the Bay Area. Ruth worked very hard, and she loved it. She did the laundry, the cooking, the general house cleaning. And when Mother Nichols entertained, the setting up of delicate lunches and afternoon teas was the responsibility of Ruth. Hmm. When Mother Nichols passed away, just before Christmas in 1976, the Nichols' relatives invited Marion to stay with them in their cottage that they owned on the property north of San Francisco. Okay. And police found her there on June 27, 1969. Somehow, they had traced her through the records of the State Driver's License Bureau. Uh, but she'd been free for almost seven years. Yeah. And she wanted her freedom even more now. She phoned the world-famous attorney Melvin Belly in 1969. He took her case immediately. He's assisted by local Arizona attorney Larry DeBus. Belly convinced the state parole board to at least review her case, pending the possibility of release. Okay. In October 1969, he appeared before the hearing with a brilliant summary about her case, her life, and brought forth many witnesses to attest for Winnie Ruth Judd her character, her innocence, and her sanity. But the board denied parole, so her attorneys campaigned, building up a public outcry for her release through the press, and when her case came again before the same parole board in February of 1971, this time they listened. Mm. And after the parade of paparazzi, the testimony, the repetitions and memories of so many years, the board declared, quote, the case is not one you sweep under the rug and forget about. As time passes, more and more people will join the ranks of those who think her sentence should be commuted. What we will see is not a question of modern penology, but the portrayal of out and out persecution of an elderly grandmother type unfortunate woman. Mm -hmm. It is incumbent upon the board to give her a commutation of sentence now, end quote. Wow. And on the early morning of December 21st, 1971, the governor of Arizona, Jack Williams, signed the papers to commute her sentence. And that night, Ruth walked out of the asylum. She was a free woman. Wow. Now, John McFadden, the lawman who saved her from the gallows in the nick of time, he found his career politically ruined afterwards. And he expected this. And he just retired from active duty claiming that he would do it all over again if he ever had the chance. Jack Halloran was fired by his silent partners in his <laughs> lumber business for the scandal he created. Yeah. He eventually disappeared into oblivion. Hmm. Many people believe that he may have even been the man who killed the two girls. There are people who say that he promised Ruth that if she stood in for him on the killings, he would see that she was freed. He then paid his way out mm. and walked away. Yeah. Now, in 2002, a letter of confession written by Ruth in her own hand was added to the Arizona State Archives from Florence Prison's death row. Remember, that's where she went first. Sure. But it won't be until 2014 that this confession letter is noticed and answers some questions about how the murders happened. So the long-held idea is that Ruth killed her friends in self-defense and then had assistance in packing them up and getting them out of town. But in this letter, which Ruth refers to as my first and only confession, she says that she snuck into the girl's house and shot the first while they slept and then fought with the other over the gun before killing her too. Really? She says she had no partner 
in crime. Really? It's a letter dated April 6, 1933. I'm only going to read a small part of it. Quote, I am writing the absolute truth of this case in full confidence that you will use it as you see fit in your best judgment, Mr. Richardson. I have full confidence in you and trust you. This is my first and only confession of the case of the homicide of Anne Leroy and Hedvig Samuelson. End quote. Wow. So she's writing this letter to her attorney. I will post the entire letter in the in-laws and outlaws. But she basically says, I did it. Yeah. All of it. Wow. She went into their house. She hid out. It wasn't Sammy she wanted to kill. It was Anne she wanted to kill for taunting her over her relationship with Jack. Okay. Ruth loved Jack. And Anne liked to taunt. That's the word that Ruth uses over and over in this letter. She would kiss him in front of her and then later talk about how she didn't even like him. Mm. And she explains that she killed them the next morning, not that night. And she cut Sammy apart because she was too heavy for her in one piece. Wow. But she does confess to all of it. That's amazing. Now, there are people who've said they heard Jack Halloran boast about killing the girls and pinning it on Ruth, who's sitting in the asylum paying for his crime. Hmm. Virginia Federer, the daughter of an Arizona legislator in the state's early days, Virginia told a writer in 1990 about her meeting with him in the late 1930s. It was New Year's Eve, and Federer and her husband were at the Adams Hotel, which was a hangout for local politicians, and there she said they met Jack. Quote, Somebody asked him a question like if he could take care of a problem and he was bragging that, sure, he could fix it. And then he said, I can't recall his exact words, but it was to the effect that if you knew the right people, you could fix anything in this town. He laughed and said that Winnie Ruth was out in the state hospital paying for what he had done. He was bragging about it, end quote. Wow. I mean, because think about it. How did a small, frail woman with a bullet in her hand cut up And put pieces into these steam trunks. Yeah, of course. And why would a wealthy playboy with connections go to such lengths to cover up a crime he wasn't even there for? Right. And there's the Dr. Brown theory where Jack threatened to out a Dr. Brown in his illegal abortion clinic if he didn't dismember the bodies. Yeah. And in the autopsy, the doctor does say these are cut apart with surgical precision. Mm Mm-hmm. But she confessed to her attorney. And the question is, where was this letter for so many years? Yeah. Ruth's attorney hid it away after reading it. And Ruth tried really hard to get it back. Okay. Between June and November of 1953, she wrote to her attorney's widow, Fern, six times asking her to return the confession. She asks her to bring the letter to her personally or to allow her brother to pick it up. But Fern never returned the letter and none of it was known until the confession letter and the letters to Fern were anonymously donated in 2001. Hmm. Because after her attorney, H.G. Richardson, read Ruth's first and only confession letter, he locked it in a safety deposit box where it stayed for 68 years. She was. As for Happy Jack, well... He died in Tucson in 1939 in his early 50s. Hmm. And as for Winnie Ruth's husband, Dr. William Judd, well, he never gave up on his bride. She was still married to him when he died in October of 1945 at the age of 62. Wow. Now, of the folks who really knew Winnie Ruth Judd, they said she wasn't a tigress or hateful. She wasn't even the jealous type. She was kind. And when she escaped the final time, she spent some time in Kingman, Arizona. I told you this already Mm -hmm. before making her way to California. Right. When she gets to Kingman, she told the local minister she was Mrs. Ruth Judd, a married woman fleeing from an abusive husband. And they took her in, as did the members of the First Assembly of God. Hmm. She lived in a trailer next to the church and helped out everyone who was kind to her. They brought her food and clothing. She cooked and cleaned for people. They called her Sister Ruth, and she even sang in the choir. She got back to church. She did, before she took off again and then went to San Francisco. Sure. Now, after her sentence was commuted and she was released, 
Winnie Ruth Judd returned to California as Marion Lane, where she lived in Stockton with her dog, Skeeter. <laughs> Great name. She died at the age of 93 wow. in her sleep, peacefully, on October 23rd, 1998. The only person who knew the entire truth of what happened that night. Hmm. But that is the story of Winnie Ruth Judd. Did she do it alone? Did she do it at all? That's all I have to say about that. So my biggest question is, why would she write a confession letter like that? What, yeah. What, what was the whole point of that? So my thinking is she either did it, mm -hmm. either she really did it, or she wrote that confession letter because she thought that Jack was going to get her out. Ah. Oh. Oh. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Wow. I think I think Jack was so embroiled in that whole thing. I mean, to the point where he was bragging about it, you yeah. know, on New Year's Eve with yeah. a bunch of politicians. Sure. And then he would, I think he would actually show up at um, the asylum for those dances just to remind her that he was in charge. Like, yeah. I'm out, you're in, don't yeah. try to do anything, I'm still here kind of yep. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, guilt is written all over him. I think so, too. I think there probably was a Dr. Brown. Yeah. I mean, who knows what was going on with him and all his buddies and all these girls and all the sex and sure. the venereal diseases going around. I mean, it seemed like it was a lot, you know, a lot of bootleg liquor. and Right. right. Yeah. Wow. Well, I guess we'll never know. Winnie Ruth took it to the grave with her. Yeah. Well, we'll never know about that, but... We definitely will know about these. Bless your hearts. Well, bless your heart. All right. Well, let's do the first one, and I'm calling it, sorry, wrong number. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Was, was that your British accent? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not going to call you Dick Van Dyke, but. <laughs> no, it's a, sorry, wrong number. That's a Monty Python reference. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, Love yeah. Monty Python. <laughs> yeah. Okay, first one. A Louisiana man is facing criminal charges likely due to technical difficulties related to text messaging. Okay. Namely, accidentally texting incriminating evidence directly to the police. I'm, how, oh, how, how'd that happen? Well, last week, a sheriff's deputy received a text message from a wrong number offering to sell crystal meth. So what did the deputy do? He arranged to meet up with Dwayne Herbert, who arrived at the predetermined location carrying not just drugs, but also two firearms. That's unfortunate for, yeah. for Dwayne. Yeah. Herbert was promptly arrested and now faces serious criminal charges for selling drugs and possession of firearms. So was he texting the wrong person? Was he texting somebody else and he actually got the cop? Is that what happened? Yeah. I mean, it's the same oh, thing okay. of dialing a wrong number and getting somebody else. He did the same thing when he was texting. Yeah. Well, listen, my, I think my phone listens to me because I either hit buttons or whatever. And like my whole conversation will be in a yeah, text thread. Like it's ready to be sent to somebody. It makes no sense. I've done that before too. All right. Number two. You had one job. Oh, I love to say this, especially <laughs> for who, honey? Who do I always say this about? The kickers on football teams. The kickers teams. on football teams. <laughs> when they miss or they hit the goalpost, yeah. you had one job. <laughs> one of the many things I love about my wife is the fact <laughs> that she loves football. I do love football. There we go. Okay. A burglar raided the wrong house, then was caught when he went back to return a stolen laptop a judge heard in court. So he wanted to he wanted to burglarize somebody's house, but not that house. Let me continue. <laughs> <laughs> you had one job. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> Gareth James, forty one, believed that he was targeting someone who owed him money, but when he opened the computer, oh. he saw the owner's name and he realized his mistake. Gotcha. There you go. He confessed the error to a pub bartender, and the prosecution said. He told her he had done something stupid. He felt embarrassed that he had gone to the wrong house. <laughs> so he went back, let himself in via an open door at the home of student Benjamin Price, 23, where police were there taking a statement. And guess oh. what? 
<laughs> he was busted. Oh. <laughs> Oops. Can you imagine what bartenders hear from people? The confessions oh that bartenders hear from people? Yeah. I've never been a bartender, but I can only imagine. Yeah, I can't imagine. <laughs> All right, number three. Well, how'd that get back there? Um, I say that a, a lot when I look in the back seat of my car and there's like trash. <laughs> you're, you're getting close. This happened in Swansboro, North Carolina. Oh, North Carolina. There you go. Police arrested a Swansboro man after spotting him dragging a safe behind his car. <laughs> I'm not kidding. WCTI TV reported that the Swansboro Police Department said the alarm at the Family Care Pharmacy on Main Street went off and officers responded. <laughs> they later spotted 22-year-old Ryan Mullins driving down the road with a safe tied to the back of his car with a <laughs> nylon rope and then arrested him. So he just pulled it out of the <laughs> pharmacy? Yep. Oh. <laughs> yep. The safe was full of prescription drugs. Mullins is charged with felony breaking and entering larceny, possession of stolen goods, two felony counts of trafficking opium or heroin, DWI, and one count of, wait for it, safe cracking. <laughs> The oh. asphalt was the safe cracker. Yeah, exactly. And probably the most obvious for just being stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so there's your bless your hearts for this week. That's good. Yeah. That's a good one. I liked that. Yeah. Well, if you have a bless your heart or you know somebody's heart who needs blessing. Like the safe cracker. Like the safe cracker. <laughs> all you got to do is go to hitchtohomicide.com where there's a pull down menu. While you're there, you can also suggest a case. Yes. And don't forget the new tab where you can tell us all about your brush with true crime. Yes, please. That's all we have today. That's my amazing husband out there. That's my beautiful bride in the booth. Join us next time on Hitch to Homicide. Bye, y'all.